Welcome to Atheist Talk. I'm your host tonight, George Kane. And Minnesota Atheists has launched a, an exciting new project, a book project. And uh, on the show tonight to help me discuss it are Bill Leto, the editor, uh, Stephanie Zavon, a contributor, and James Zimmerman, who's on the editorial board. So welcome, all each of you. Uh, Bill, can you tell us where the idea for the book came from? Sure. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a combination of a couple different uh, uh, things that came up. Um, I, work, I work in publishing, and several years ago, back when I was in California, we did a book called uh, When Faith Meets Reason, which was a, an anthology of faith journeys of actually critical biblical scholars. And there was a couple of atheists in that volume, but mostly it was people who still had some kind of tie to religion. And uh, ever since that time, I've, I've thought it would be fun to be part of a book project that was strictly on atheist journeys um, of some kind. And this is kind of random, but um, out here in Minnesota a couple years ago, there was something called the Minnesota Beatles Project, where local bands did Beatle covers for a CD. It was then charitable, where it went to, I think it was some kind of charity that uh, um, to help uh, um, music in schools, music programs. And so I just, it just kind of clicked for me that that would be a neat, a neat way to do this. It would be just make it a local thing that would then support uh, Minnesota atheists. So that's kind of the, the start of it. Stephanie, do you know of any similar projects anywhere? There are books that are similar, of course, in that there are um, collections of atheist essays. Um, but this project, as far as I know, is unique in a couple of ways. Um, there are several books that are collections from a single author. Um, there are collections like 50 Voices of Disbelief um, that are largely collections of um, authors who are talking about this, about atheism from a more scholarly perspective, um, heavily represented philosophers, that sort of thing. Um, there aren't that many that are just kind of average every day about atheism. The closest, the one that I can think of um, is the Atheist's Guide to Christmas. Um, but again, that's all very big names and that one's meant to be funny. Um, and while well, there's some funny stuff in this book, um, that's not the point of the book. Um, so this I think is really unique in that it brings together voices of everyday atheists, people who don't write all the time, people who aren't known in the movement. Um, and I think that really affects the focus of the book uh, as well as just the voice of the book. It's remarkably Minnesotan. <laughs> so Bill, how did the project come together? Um, well, when I had this idea, I first brought it to a couple friends of mine at the uh, Minnesota Atheist Book Group in Burnsville, uh, Jill Carlson and Eric Jane. And they were on board right away and wanted to, wanted to help out. And then I brought it to the uh, a board meeting that you were at, I remember, um, Minnesota Atheist Board Meeting, and you guys all liked the idea, as long as it was on my plate, because you guys had a lot, <laughs> lot going on, which is, was the idea anyways. And uh, you guys recommended several people um, who you thought would uh, be good on the project and uh, form an initial committee. And uh, a couple of board members were on that, and, and James, you had recommended, who does the newsletter. And that was a real uh, bonanza for the project, getting James on. He's, he was really a workhorse on this thing. Um, and then we, we all got together and uh, uh, decided on sort of a, a timeline for the project. And uh, the, the start of it was putting out a call for papers and also a call for volunteers um, at the same time. And we, we got really good responses to both. So James, how did the uh, editorial committee decide on which essays to pick? Did, first off, did you get a lot of submissions? Uh, yeah, there was more than double the number that we uh, ended up putting in the book. Uh, so was, was there five or six people on the editorial committee? Five plus okay. me, I think. Okay, yeah. so six if you count okay. Bill. And um, <laughs> submissions all went straight to Bill, and then he would anonymize them, if that's mm -hmm. a word. He'd remove their name, and obviously if they mentioned their name or like the name of their spouse or child in the essay, I believe he removed that just to give it some anonymity. And then he sent the essays out to four people on the editorial committee, and then we were to read them and rate them from one to five. Uh, five basically meant we really want this in there, you know, and four was more like, it, it can go in there, but it might need some tweaking. And one pretty much meant this, <laughs> this isn't one that we like at all. And then um, those were uh, 
added up and we like were shooting for a minimum score in order for it to get get in so i think if it was like a minimum of 15 which meant the four raiders all gave it around a, a four mm -hmm. then uh, that was pretty good so we, that was pretty much a shoe in you know uh, although we did have a, a discussion on the phone in case anyone felt really strongly about why one should be or not be included and then there were a couple that ended up on the cusp you know maybe they got a total score of 12 or 13 and then um maybe like if i was one who rated one low i would Argue, I argued why I didn't think it belonged in there, but then maybe someone who, who had rated it high would say, well, here's what I think, and we tried to reach a consensus, and obviously we eventually did. So then once we had the, the, the number in there, then that's what we went with. Okay, and you were a contributor, and Stephanie was a contributor. Uh, you each did a chapter, so... But it was still, it was still fair, because I didn't rate my own. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. all right. So, uh, and it, so that's why each book was only, each chapter was only sent to four. Yeah, I think yeah, Bill could probably answer that question, but I think that's why it was done. So I don't, I, in a couple of cases, I found out later whose essays I rated because I would read one and be like, oh, that was by so-and-so. Okay, good. I like that one. You know, but in a lot of cases, I forgot which ones I had uh, actually edited. But, but yeah, even if people from the editorial committee submitted one, I think Bill was cognizant of making sure that they didn't rate their own. You know? <laughs> okay, so when you were deciding what to write about, uh, how did you frame your topic? Are you addressing me here again? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> how did it come? How did you? Put well, it together? I I have written a lot about my own experience leaving religion and becoming an atheist. So I thought I want to write about a topic <coughs> about my own life that I hadn't written about before, and I had never written about um, the matter of headship and gender roles within the religion that I had been a part of. So I thought, I'll, I'll write about that. And actually, when I was still in the religion, I one day just decided I didn't want to be the head of the house anymore. That's, we were taught that men were always the head of the house, you know, even though we had, we had no children. There were just two of us. I was still the head of just my wife. But I just one day, I was joking about it with my wife and said, I don't want to be the head of the house anymore. I think it's dumb. And so that was kind of the germ for, for my story. So I began by telling that little almost silly incident that happened while we were still religious. And we stayed in the religion for like five years after that. Mm -hmm. But then from that, I used that to frame my whole story of what I thought about the gender roles within the religion, what I think of them now that I'm not religious, and how even when I spoke on the phone with my mom, who's still in this, that religion, how it was really driven home to me how sexist the, that religion is. And I really, I, I actually laughed at her. And then I, I had to backpedal and apologize because I, should have been more respectful to my mother, but I, I had to apologize, but then say, you know, I'm basically, I'm sorry, but this is just very sexist, you know. So that, that was basically what my story was. Okay. And you, Stephanie? Um, for me, I have kind of an odd relationship to organized atheism. Um, I grew up without religion. I um, grew up in a community where it wasn't really polite, actually several communities, where it wasn't really polite to talk about religion because it could be divisive. Um, and so it didn't, religion didn't have the same central role in my life that it has for a lot of people who um, are strong in atheist activism. Um, a lot of people come to it because they've been specifically hurt by it, by religion come to atheist activism because they've been hurt by religion. And, and that wasn't it for me. Um, so it took a kind of a different path for me to understand um, that actually being active as an atheist was important. Um, and I very much came to it through politics. Um, but I found out that even within those communities where um, we didn't talk about religion, and for a lot of people, it wasn't that big a deal. Um, there were still a lot of atheists who ended up needing somebody to talk to and just needed to know that there were other atheists out there. Um, so when I did come out, in a lot of ways, my world changed. Um, one of the contributors in the book is a college friend of mine. We'd never discussed religion. We'd never discussed atheism. But here it is in 20 years later, and we're both in this book. Um, so I thought that was a uh, unusual perspective and wanted to share it. Interesting. Bill, did you find a lot of commonality between the stories? Is there a typical uh, atheist in Minnesota story? <laughs> Not really. I mean, 
you know, I was thinking about this, and I think the only commonality really is that we're all atheists in or from Minnesota. I mean, th there are some, some commonalities among some, like a lot of people wrote about leaving faith and, and that experience, and a lot of people wrote about coming out. But uh, I think one of the strengths of the collection is that, you know, these stories come from all over the place, from people with different backgrounds. Um, people wrote about different things. People wrote about grief as an atheist. People wrote about uh, uh, raising children as an atheist, you know. So uh, they might have uh, something they've found that's, that's more in common, but I think it's really diverse. Sure. What are your thoughts, James? Yeah, I thought there was a lot of uh, people leaving their religion, I guess my story came mm -hmm. under that heading too. And we, we, Bill even grouped them into four sections in the book based on a certain commonality. And one of them was leaving faith. So I did notice a lot of that. In fact, when I would receive a submission to rate and it wasn't about that, I almost got excited because I was like, oh good, this is something <laughs> right. different, you know. Yeah, uh, certainly in Minnesota, probably more than if, if you were to do this project in either coast, uh, the young people come into uh, atheism from religious families True. rather than having a long history in the family of, of atheism. Mm -hmm. There was at least one story by a person from a longtime family of atheists. Yeah, there, I think there were a handful of people who did not grow up in religion, mm -hmm. um, Stephanie being one, but uh, yeah, there was one who wrote, uh, went deep into the family history about it, yeah, yeah. and really staunch atheists back in the family history. Okay. Stephanie, and what did you see about the commonality? I found something um, kind of interesting in what was represented, particularly in um, political views. In a lot of ways, this book is more um, radical, and I don't mean extreme, I mean actually going in and, and questioning the foundations of um, lots of things about our society and about our politics in a way that most books that exist to basically present atheism as a friendly or reasonable thing to an audience that might not have a lot of experience with atheism um, usually do. And there's been a lot of talk in the atheist communities um, recently about social justice mm -hmm. and about um, community, and that was actually something else that came up in this. And I find in a lot of ways this book, by going to the common experience of, of people who just, the only thing they really have in common is that they're connected to Minnesota, um, represents those concerns a lot better than most of the mainstream atheist books out there. Right, uh, probably because it's about group of Minnesota atheists that one thing that Minnesota atheists as an organization provides or tries to provide is community in a sense that uh, and I think many people are unaware that uh, there is an atheist community that we're trying to grow. Uh, some of the stories are about uh, crises of, uh, of faith. I think we're uh, touching on that a little. Any that were particularly striking to you? I found it interesting that there were so many faith traditions mm. presented, and yet, in a lot of ways, the, the crises were very similar. Um, there were two basic ways that people came to atheism out of religion, um, and one was a social justice path, mm. and one was simply over and over people who sat down and studied their religion and found out what it really was. Sure. I know that within Minnesota atheists, we've always had uh, uh, people who, you know, were so intensely into their religion that uh, they were ministers and then became atheists through study of, of the Bible and what they're supposed to be doing as ministers and, and instead came to the atheist conclusion. So there were, most of these stories are stories of, uh, of coming out as atheists, right? Not specifically about that. There's okay. a section on it. Okay. Um, and I guess a lot of the essays do involve that at some point, but 
Not, uh, I mean, a majority of them didn't focus on that. I mean, Stephanie's was a good example of one that, that does largely. Um, but a lot of them did touch on it. Mm -hmm. The book, of course, is uh, uh, a snapshot in time of what uh, yeah. uh, atheists are like in Minnesota now. Uh, I wonder if you've thought of that, how the stories are different now than they would have been if you'd done this project a few decades ago. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a tough question. We had several submissions that were from the GLBT community. Okay. I don't know if they would have been as vocal back in the 50s or 60s because they would have had two, two reasons to be doubly scared to come out in public. Mm -hmm. They still kind of do, but not, not as much, I like to think. I think that's one not noticeable difference. Um, I was pleased that we had so many submissions from women, too, that might, we might not have heard as much from them had this been 40, 50 years ago either. Right. Probably wouldn't have gotten enough submissions for a book, I would think. I mean, it was probably a much bigger deal coming out back then, or more damaging, I would think, than sure. it is now. I mean, still people are afraid of it. And we had, uh, early on, we decided we weren't going to do anonymous submissions. I mean, that wouldn't be with the spirit of the thing. Um, but we, I still had people requesting, is there any way I can do it anonymous or pseudonym, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's still, it's still risky for people, but I would think it's gotten a lot better. Sure. Well, and there is one essay in there from somebody who this is their coming out. Yeah, that's right. Oh. Somebody who yeah. has been um, active in academia for a long time and is now retired and finally feels like he can come out. Yeah, that's right. I, I've known people who you know, would not uh, allow their name to be printed mm -hmm. in the newsletter, even, if, uh, even though they were continuous uh, donors, uh, mm. made contributions to us. Uh, one who was uh, a church organist. Oh, wow. <laughs> and there's an essay in here by John Q. Public. We suspect he's hiding something, too. <laughs> oh, that's possible. Yeah, but, that's you know, suspicious. we didn't want to give him the fifth degree. Yeah. Um, were there any stories that you really felt were a unique story that really stand out as different from all the others? Any that struck you? I can think of a couple. Is it okay if I start? Yeah. Um, yeah. There was one that's titled, Who You Gonna Call? Which whenever I hear that phrase, I immediately think of the song based you know, <laughs> from the Ghostbusters movie. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what it was about. This man had been a professional ghost hunter. And you mentioned earlier the commonality of so many people in Minnesota being part of a Christian tradition and leaving that. It was, it was fun to, to hear this. You know, a lot of people were sitting in their small Lutheran church or whatever here in Minnesota, but no one else submitted anything about being a Ghostbuster. And yeah. I just thought it was a really fun story. And in a way, I was kind of laughing at it because it seemed so absurd. And I think the author would la laugh at himself too now, when he, now that he's left that. But in doing that ghost hunting, he came to the realization that there's just nothing to it, you know, especially when he, he went and attended a convention where he saw other people who were nuts about other things, that there's aliens being hidden in Roswell or that Kennedy was killed by LG, L, LBJ and the mafia and Castro and the commies, you know, like all these different things that people really were believing. And he realized, oh, wait, my ghost hunting is no different than that. That's so true. I really got, got a kick out of that essay and I really enjoyed it for being unique as opposed to so many of the other stories. And the other one that comes to mind is uh, called One Self-Reliant Species. And it, unlike the others, it wasn't really a first-person narrative. It was more just, here's what we as atheists need to do. Here's facts written very poetically, I thought. Facts about our planet, our environment, our overpopulation issue, and our future, things we need to face. We need to face reality. As atheists, we should be in the forefront of facing reality. But it kind of ends as a clarion call to, it says something like, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, come on, wake up. We've got a lot of work to do. And I, I thought that was a really good essay. And I think at one time I either emailed or talked to Bill and said, this one works best if it's last, because it's kind of saying, mm -hmm. now that you've read this, don't just put it down and go about your life. Do something. So I really think that what, what maybe could have been perceived as too odd even to be in the book ended up being like the, the climax almost to me. So I really liked that essay as well. Bill? Um, there's a, there, I mean, there's so many of them that are unique. Um, just when James is talking, a, a couple came to mind. In, in one, um, a woman writes about her husband falling into religion big time, um, becoming fundamentalist, and, and she's still working through that. And I thought that was fascinating. And she really put herself out there with this essay, I think, talking about that. 
And then in the final section, um, there's, a, there's quite a few, which we entitled, uh, titled uh, Ethics in Action. There's several that are, that are very unique. Um, for example, uh, uh, Chris Stedman talks about how he's, he's become an interfaith atheist, and he's trying to get atheism into the interfaith talk, which mm -hmm. I, th I think is interesting. And there was one more that really stood out for me. Um, we think of atheism as coming out of Christianity, um, but there is one essay in there that is a really very sympathetic and loving portrait of growing up in a New Age cult that oh. you're not going to find a lot of places. Right. Right. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, do you believe uh, the collection represents uh, the actual diversity of Minnesota atheists? How well do you think it uh, represents the community? Well, I, I mentioned before that there were quite a few submissions from the JLBT community, and I think that was good. Several of them ended up in the final mm -hmm. book, and a couple of people also tied it in with their veganism or vegetarianism, so it was nice to get that perspective. And from what I gather, although we didn't take a census, there was quite a variety of ages represented. There were people who seemed to be having just left their teen years mm -hmm. recently, all the way to people who, as Stephanie mentioned, are retired senior citizens now. So I think we, we did a really good job representing people from every decade, from 20s to 80s, I'm sure are covered in there. So. I can certainly understand why uh, GLBT people would want oh, to yeah. contribute to this book. Would would have uh, would be attracted to atheism, and, and I think that not only Minnesota atheists, but every atheist organization I've come in contact with is very welcoming of uh, of gays, and lesbians. Uh, but a vegan now, what what attraction? What connection is there between atheism and veganism? If I'm re recalling it correctly, it had to do with respecting life and viewing this as the only life that we have, and so, uh, and also being connected to all species. We weren't specially created by a deity, mm. so um, I'm not going to eat my my pet dog. Why would I eat the pig? You know that kind of viewpoint. So uh, in the essay, it really made sense to me. I myself am a vegetarian, so I also appreciated the essay. I think that was a tie-in. If, if I'm remembering right, there are two essays in there where the, the person strongly advocates or, or discusses their, their not, not eating meat, and they both tied it in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the collection is, um, as the group of atheists who are active in Minnesota, uh, fairly educated and fairly white. But okay. within true. that, it's, it's a diverse crowd. Yeah, and, and that accurately reflects the organization mm -hmm. that uh, uh, I know that we've often tried reaching out to the black community, but we don't seem to have too much of a grounding in that. Uh, the group is uh, overwhelmingly ma male, too, to, the, to this day. The women uh, are well represented in the book. I okay. think they're around a third or so of the total entries in the book. So. It definitely doesn't fit in with Minnesota as a whole. I would imagine they're fifty percent or so, but it still is a very good representation. A little over a third, I think. Okay. One little interesting thing: um, they're not spread evenly through the book. The one, the one leaving the face section for some reason that was dominantly male. There was one woman um, contributor, and that's the longest section in the book. So I don't know what you know that might be interesting in some way. I can't think of, but sounds like a thesis opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, do you think this book will have uh, any impact beyond just Minnesota? I, I really hope it does, simply mm -hmm. because it does talk about social justice. It does talk about community. It does talk about raising kids without faith. It talks about meeting life challenges without faith. Um, there's somebody in there who talks about his alcoholism and dealing with that. Um, so I think it meets a lot more needs than your average book of atheist essays, and I really hope it gets the wide view that I think it deserves. A number of the reviews that have come in already and endorsements, mm -hmm. those people who wrote those seem to imply that there's, there's room, there's opportunity for it to reach beyond the borders of our state and to change people's lives. Yeah, and those endorsers are all, I mean, only think one was right. from Minnesota, right. I think. They're from other 
other states. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of, I was kind of hoping also that it might inspire some other states to try something like this. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another hope. I mean, I don't know that that'll happen, but. I would love to read Atheist Voices of Texas. Yeah. <laughs> or anywhere south. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Sure, it might be uh, interesting to contrast mm -hmm. the, yeah. uh, the experience mm -hmm. of atheism in different regions of the country. I'm sure the Bible Belt would be a lot different. Than yeah, I'm just thinking it would be a nice contrast. Uh, well, of course, I'm, I'm here in the Twin Cities right now, so I can't speak for the other counties around, but this is a very liberal-minded area, so it seems mm -hmm. probably pretty easy to be atheist or GLBT or vegetarian in this area, so I, I would like to compare it to an area where it'd be a little bit more stifling. Of course, if you try Atheist Voices of California or something, you might get half the state trying to contribute. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. All right, so uh, when is the book uh, coming out? Uh, the, the official release date is August 28th. It'll probably go on sale a little before that. Um, probably going to be on sale at the uh, Atheist Regional Convention that'll be out here. I think August 11th is the date. Yep. Right. And um, yeah. Okay, and uh, will it be available in bookstores? How, how can people? Yeah, we're gonna try to get it into bookstores. It'll be on amazon.com, it'll be on barnesandnoble.com. Actually, you can already pre-order it on those sites. Oh. Um, we're gonna have it at, uh, for sale at Atheist Events, at Minnesota Atheist Events. Um, again, I'm trying, to get it, trying to get it into bookstores, Barnes and Noble, some other local bookstores. And we're gonna do, we already have a few uh, speaking engagements planned at bookstores, and uh, James is setting up one at Hamlin University. And we're really hoping it'll be a, adopted in college classrooms, and there's some, already some leads there. Oh, yeah, really? the professor oh, yeah. of one of the professors of religion there says he would like to really use it for his class. I'm hoping he does. Even if he doesn't use it for his class, he's pretty much guaranteed us uh, an evening to talk with the students and read excerpts from the book. Well, wow. so it uh, sounds like the book is already having a, a very uh, prominent launch, so mm -hmm. uh, uh, certainly hope for the best for it. Thank you, Bill and Stephanie Thanks, George. and James. It's been a uh, uh, very interesting conversation, and I hope that uh, the audience will try to get hold of this book, will make a point to get hold of this book and read it. There are a lot of interesting stories. If you contact us by contacting the, uh, us through any of the uh, website or address that have been flashed on the screen throughout the program. Uh, we will send you one copy of our newsletter, and this is a typical newsletter. James is the editor of it. And if you send us your email address, we'll put you on distribution for our weekly calendar of atheist events. If you're interested in us, we are interested in you. <laughs>